previously. But then, a genius idea hit me. The perfect way to kill time before my adult brain shifts again. I'm gonna make fun of JK Rowling for being a sad baby loser. And another thing! So the last time we discussed Harold Twatter and the fetish turf of Alcatraz, we largely kept things centered on how J.K. Rowling is a bad writer that is bad at writing and can't story and is stupid. But I also mentioned that the Harry Potter books were always enjoyable in the moments they were centered around the characters. This didn't take up much of the video, but since then I've been inundated with the claim that the problems with the series are baked into its DNA and as such they remain unsalvageable. Now I don't like this approach for one very simple reason. It isn't funny. This idea that the Harry Potter books are some dangerous conservative propaganda is probably what Rowling wants you to think, and it's a lot funnier if the skeleton of a good story is there, but the creator is just too much of a blithering idiot to recognize otherwise. It's the same way I feel about Steven Universe lately. I could paint this idea of Steven Universe's obsessive forgiveness as dangerous to kids and teaches them really bad attitudes about both abuse and bigotry, and believe me, it is all of those things, but it's a lot funnier to suggest that there's the skeleton of a good story in there and its only real sticking point being that the showrunner was too much of a dumb shit weeb to realize it. That's a lot funnier. Kind of like how Jojo Rabbit just went with the reality that Hitler was this stupid, pathetic sack of shit who took children's literature way too seriously. To that end, we're gonna do two things. Uh, we're gonna take dumb things Potterheads say and demonstrate why they're dumb by demonstrating why the wizard books are dumb. Look, the patrons voted for this and I didn't really know what to do, all right? Let's just have some cathartic fun at the expense of stupid, evil people. This does mean, in some places, I might have to praise some aspects of the wizard books, but you know what? I think you'll fucking live. Throughout the internet, you will always hear the same take. Book Hermione was a flawed character, while Film Hermione was a hashtag strong female character girl boss, and so Book Hermione was better. It's a take seen so many times that there's entire essays about it, presuming that Book Hermione is a better role model for young girls, but the problem is that the caricature of Hermione in the films is not independent of the books. It's a problem caused by the books. The Harry Potter films have to condense seven books, four of which are abominably long, into eight two and a half hour films. That means shit has to get cut and condensed, and characters have to become less fleshed out than they were previously, for better or worse. Just as Harry loses most of his depth as a character by virtue of losing his inner monologue, Hermione loses most of her flaws by virtue of the fact that most of her flaws involve things that you can't really put into a film for children in the 2000s. So let's go through all of Hermione's flaws in the book. She's bossy, she's pushy, she's a nag, she's an insufferable know-it-all, she's a busybody poking her nose into other people's business, and she's anti-slavery. Let's start with that last one because it's the easiest to unpack. In the fourth book, Hermione is horrified at the way Barty Crouch treats Winky, and so later, when she learns about the Hogwarts house elves, she starts getting very vocally into the idea of freeing the elves. And she's treated like a naive busybody for doing this by almost every character, from Ron to Hagrid to even Harry, who doesn't necessarily disagree with Hermione, but finds that she's just so annoying about it, like, oh my god. Only Sirius really defends her against Ron's criticisms, which proceeds to get immediately undercut in the next book, and even the house elves are offended by her attempts to free them. This is, simply put, a fucking gross subplot. It's so fucking gross that it's universally condemned by damn near everyone, even the most ardent Potterheads. It's so hated, and so stupid, that Jojo had to write a defensive article trying to stick it to the haters, just in case you ever thought there was a point where she wasn't a defensive loudmouth. So the films cut the subplot out because could you imagine, could you imagine trying to keep the spew plotline in? Could you imagine them looking the viewer dead in the eye and saying, Elf slavery is a good thing? That's the kind of thing you hear from human and orc mains on the WoW forums. So yeah, we can safely write that one off as not a flaw. But what about the others? Well, the problem is that most of Hermione's flaws in the books are just sexist tropes. The idea of a woman being a bossy, naggy busybody is not a concept that is unique to Hermione Granger. This is just how every male stand-up comedian talks about their wives. This is bottom of the barrel fucking boomer humor. Oh hey guys, the girl is a nag and against the two boys and won't let them have any fun. Oh but wait Lily, I hear you say, she has another flaw. She panics under stress and struggles using magic outside of a controlled environment. Oh great, we can add hysterical woman emotions into the mix. What a Flawed, complex, three-dimensional character you have here, Jojo. Definitely not a walking caricature of all your feelings about women. This is not compelling character work, even stripped of those flaws in isolation. Hermione's strengths largely come around to doing the boys' homework for them. Be it their essays or their work fighting Voldemort, she's the one doing much of the heavy lifting in the story, and the one who figures out all the MacGuffins they need to save the day or destroy Voldemort's soul jars. So she does much of the grunt work for the characters who can't be bothered doing it most of the time. Hermione's entire character in the books 
is about doing the boys' work for them, getting dressed down as a nag when she expects them to do their own work, and taking abuse from both of them without vocal objections. And the thing about the films is that a lot of this casual cruelty is just absent. Hermione isn't shown doing their homework for them as much in the films, it's basically one scene where she offers to do an introduction for an essay for Ron, and outside of a few scenes in the first and third film, she isn't being derided for being a bossy nag because of her reactions to the boys' behavior, and she isn't taking abuse from them in the third, fourth, and sixth films anywhere near as frequently as in the books, so when you strip away those things, because they should be stripped away, you're left with a hyper-competent character with no flaws because all of her flaws were little more than reasonable responses to other people's bad behavior. They can't strip everything away, they still have Hermione fall in love with Ron instead of cutting off all contact with him and marrying Luna instead because of an edict from on high demanded Hermione degrade herself, but outside of a few isolated scenes in the third, fourth, and sixth films, the Hermione abuse is largely absent from the films, as it should be. It's not really the film's fault that what's left is a typical girl boss because there isn't much Hermione could be otherwise. People will complain that Hermione isn't a three-dimensional character with her own agency in the films, but no female character in Harry Potter was ever going to be able to be that, because they are inherently limited by the writing of an author who doesn't like women and doesn't like writing women and has very retrograde views of womanhood. This is a writer who publishes her work under male pseudonyms and constantly thinks about cocks. I don't think she even likes being a woman. I love steak! Other girls don't. I'm actually more like a dude. Hey guys, don't come in my room. I might be rubbing one in. One element of the books up until the release of the first movie was that Ron was actually a more popular character than Hermione, and that made sense because Ron was the goofball making the silly jokes, while the narrative routinely beat it into the viewer's head that Hermione was a no-fun nag who it's okay to treat like shit. And when you're a kid, this is probably your first experience with the trope of a nagging woman ruining the boys' fun. In the last few years, people have pointed out that Rowling's supposed love of the idea of Hermione being black doesn't really gel with the fact that one of the major characters literally screams in her face that slavery is good and slaves enjoy it. But I honestly think the bigger concern is the way the books just casually mistreat Hermione at every turn and vilify her when she objects to it, things that become far worse when it's two white guys doing it to a black girl. Or the scene in the films where instead of using the Cruciatus curse like every other torture scene, Hermione gets straddled and has a racial slur carved into her arm. Rowling loves black Hermione, yeah, in the same way Calvin Candy does all best. Given the situation with Hermione in the books, the film's decision to just make Hermione into an unstoppable girl boss who could no-scope a guy from across the map is a decision I wholeheartedly embrace. I think it's understandable that Clovis probably didn't have the time to rewrite an entirely new character in her place, which is something Hermione and Ron both desperately needed. I think it's safe to say that Ron is probably the most divisive character in the series. I've met people who absolutely despise him, I've met people who love him and think the movies ruined him, ah, that old chestnut again. Indeed, Ron suffers from many of the same writing foibles that plague other characters, particularly Rowling being unable to help herself and not take things to Eleven all the time, especially in regards to Ron's relationship with Hermione. See. As has been established earlier, J.K. Rowling doesn't like being a woman, and doesn't like women, and doesn't want women to be in happy relationships. She is one of the most painfully heteronormative people in the world, and the most painfully heteronormative relationship dynamic in the world is being constantly negged by your partner. Hence, Ron constantly negs Hermione. This isn't even Ron's fault. I'm not even saying this to villainize Ron. It's Jojo Rabbit's fault he's like this, because he has to be like this, because this is what Rowling thinks romance is. Ron's casual toxicity towards Hermione forms the bulk of most of his character issues, and even in the book they feel out of place and awkward. Even when the book tries to present it as some kind of game that Hermione enjoys playing with him, again, Jojo Nutball here thinks that this is what romance is. So characterizing Hermione as enjoying all of this feels too similar to how she characterizes the house elves. So that covers most of Ron's antics. You could take 90% of his bad behavior and go, oh, Rowling is forcing this into his character because this is how she signals romance because she's a conservative nutcase. And outside of that, Ron is only in the right once in Prisoner of Azkaban when all he wants is an apology for what he thinks is Crookshanks eating scabbers. The rest is jealousy. Indeed, Ron's jealousy is an established aspect of him from the first book. He's a character always overshadowed by his brothers and his friends. Hell, when he looks into the mirror of Erised, he sees himself as his self-insert fanfiction OC, who is head boy, Quidditch captain, and won the Quidditch Cup. So there's a running theme of narcissism behind Ron's character. People often have trouble grappling with this because they're raised to believe that narcissists are self-aggrandizing people who think they're God's gift to the world, and as a result, they spend way too much time armchair diagnosing YouTubers. But self-flagellation, angst, envy, and self-hatred can also be narcissistic 
narcissistic. Narcissism is first and foremost about being self-obsessed, either through learned behavior, as is the case with most, or compulsively, as is the case with narcissistic personality disorder. Yes, Twitter users, those are in fact two different things. And this is very much the case with Ron. Ron is self-obsessed. He lets his envy get the better of him. His self-esteem is almost entirely reliant on others, and it bothers him when others have something that he doesn't. And this could be an interesting element to his character, because these aren't qualities that make Ron a bad person. I have friends who think and behave like this. But the books never really unpack it. Nobody ever sits Ron down to explain to him that Harry's fame and wealth came at the cost of his family, and that he probably envies Ron growing up with loving parents and surrounded by siblings. You know, it's that old classic, the grass is greener kind of thing. Or that Hermione's skill and aptitude at magic is almost forced on her by the fact that being a muggle-born means she is subtly pushed to justify her own existence in the wizarding world at every possible opportunity. But that would require Rowling to believe that systemic bigotry is a thing and is a problem. Nobody ever has to unpack the fact that the things Ron envies about his friends are actually a terrible position to be in. It's just Ron lashing out at people, and then when the fight is over, we never talk about it again. Ron's self-protective narcissism comes up again in the Yule Ball, where when he's trying to ask Hermione out, he's trying to paint it like he's doing her a favor. And even Hermione, who usually tolerates this kind of behavior, pretty much shuts him down at every opportunity. This is the first and last time I've ever seen acid used as a tone indicator. One thing for a bloke to shut alone. Forget it, it's just sad. I won't be going alone because, believe it or not, someone's asked me. And I said yes. This is one of the most pathetic attempts to save his own pride I've ever seen, and neither the book nor the movie let Ron off the hook for it. And then later at the Yule Ball, he practically ruins her night out of spite by trying to convince Hermione that Crumb is using her to get to Harry. Oh, and this was after already treating Harry like shit over his name being put in the goblet. Oh, gee, I wonder why people decided they didn't like Ron in this book. There's a bit in the final book that people often complain about being made different in the movie, and that's when Ron kind of rubs the fact that Harry's parents are dead in his face. In the books, it's painted in this kind of I have bigger worries thing, but the actual line isn't much better. Oh, you're sure, are you? Right then. Well, I won't bother about them. It's all right for you two, isn't it, with your parents safely out of the way? This is a pretty fucking nasty thing to say to someone regardless of what you're going through. And the films pretty much preserve that. You think I'm not listening to? You think I don't know how this feels? Oh, you don't know how it feels! Your parents are dead! You have no family! I'm not on board with people who claim this is a betrayal of Ron's character, because this scene in the book isn't much better. It's like, maybe 5% better, and that's not saying much. Whether you soften the blow a little or not, claiming an actual orphan has less problems to worry about is deeply insensitive, and the kind of thing that should honestly ruin a friendship, or at the very least earn yourself a good thwack across the nose. Indeed, the problem with Ron is that Rowling offers all kinds of context for his behavior in the books, but even with that context, it's kind of up to the viewer to decide if they actually give a shit. It's up to the individual reader if the explanations for Ron's behavior make that behavior worth putting up with. And it seems like a lot of people decided that it didn't. And I'm one of those people. There's a good character in Ron, but it's buried under Rowling's unwillingness to just not make characters behave like absolute fucking jackasses for five seconds. This isn't just a Ron problem, by the way, Harry can be pretty fucking rude when he wants to, but it's usually contained to his internal monologue, and he usually possesses enough manners to not voice every mean, borderline sexist thought he has about Hermione, which is a little better. Fundamentally, the problem is the intent and execution are locked in this battle with each other because you're trying to have a sympathetic character written by a woman who fundamentally doesn't understand what makes people sympathetic, and flat out cannot comprehend the idea of people reading her characters differently than she does and failing to account for that at every turn. In Rowling's mind prison, being a rude, passive-aggressive bitch isn't enough of a reason for your friends to deck you across the head. And to everyone else, that is a stupid thing to think. So I'm not surprised that the same person who tried and failed to vilify campus activism failed to get a lot of people to really sympathize with Ron. And I think the issue with Ron is even better explained by... Okay, the Snape section is gonna be long because there's like two halves to Snape's character. One of them is actually pretty good, and the other is really fucking stupid. Snape is THE modern redemption arc. Some people like to claim it's Zuko, but putting aside the fact I've already explained why Zuko isn't a redemption, he's a recovery arc, Snape is more indicative of redemption arcs in practice, as it's very poorly thought out, often inadequate, and smugly pats itself on the back about how clever it is, all the while face-planting into the dirt. Snape is the connective tissue to the diamonds. Snape is the character we need to analyze to figure out why redemption arcs are often 
and so badly written. Because it is the reason these stories are badly written. Because the story really wants Snape to be morally grey at nearly all times, but fails. There's a kind of character out there that really ruffles fandom feathers, and that's a character that is often presented as morally grey by the narrative, but in practice they're just a heroic character with a really noxious personality. The moments where they present moral greyness are few and far between, and most of the time they're just being a catty bitch to others. They generally don't slip into grey or evil unless the lead writer changes and starts fucking with them. Think Earth Not Rex, Amity Blight, Sylvanas Windrunner, and indeed Severus Snape. Indeed, while Snape is often seen as a character with questionable motivations, the book reinforces at nearly every turn that Snape is ostensibly a good guy. But the kind of good guy who is just a rude asshole who nobody really wants around, but, you know, they kind of need him around. The books actually spend more time reinforcing that Snape is an ally of Dumbledore first and foremost, even having it revealed in a flashback in the middle of the series that Snape was a spy. He's a red herring as early as the first book, so the books make it pretty clear that Snape is on the Order's side. And what few times it looks like it isn't, Snape is just being reasonable. Like, I honestly think it's hilarious that Harry tries to warn Snape about Sirius in front of Umbridge, and obviously Snape is going to lie and say he has no idea what Harry's talking about in front of a ministry official, and Harry just assumes this was treachery or obliviousness and gallivants off into a trap when it would have probably been faster to double check after coming out of the forest. Like, this is probably the dumbest plot contrivance in the entire series, and I means Sirius's death is this hollow thing that only happens because the plot has to break itself in half, forcing it to happen. I think if anything, by the end of Order of the Phoenix, if you were a reader who still thought Snape was secretly evil, you were kind of just stupid. It isn't until the very end of the sixth book that this changes, and even then it's telegraphed to the reader that shit is probably not what it looks like. And even the fandom view of Snape as some kind of incel doesn't really line up with reality, because for all of his toxicity and their friendship and his inability to let go, Snape never turned scorn onto Lily for rejecting him. When he ended their friendship, Snape left her alone, and when they were put in danger by Voldemort, Snape went to great lengths to try and prevent that. This isn't how incels behave. If Snape was an incel, he would have murdered Lily himself out of rage and entitlement, along with about maybe 12 other red-headed women. Snape is the opposite of an incel, because Lily's safety is the only thing that really matters to him. Now, a simp, yes. Pathetic, yes. A loser, yes. <laughs> he is all of those things. I think it's understandable that Snape never really gets over Lily, because that love is being constantly fueled by guilt. Snape was the one who told Voldemort about the prophecy, and is indirectly responsible for the death of his friend, and he's largely dedicated the rest of his life to protecting her child. Guilt permeates this character, and he's been performing a lifelong penance for that guilt. I think if you were responsible for the death of your childhood best friend who you love dearly, and had to spend most of your time around her orphan child, you would never really get over it. I think that guilt and anger is most exemplified in The Prisoner of Azkaban by a single scene. Come out, come out and play! Vengeance is sweet. I hope I'd be the one to catch you. Remus and I have some unfinished business to attend to. Give me a read. I... Why don't you run along and play with your chemistry set? I could do it, you know. But why deny the Dementors? They're so longing to see you. Do I detect a flicker of fear? Oh, yes. A Dementors kiss. One can only imagine what that must be like to endure. It's said to be nearly unbearable to witness, but I'll do my best. Severus. It's almost pitiful, especially when you consider that he largely did that to himself. I think it's pretty reductionist to reduce Snape's character down to just still obsessed with his schoolyard crush, because that crush is literally dead, and it's his fault that she's dead, and he knows this. I think the movies really emphasize this aspect of Snape, because Alan Rickman knew from the first film what the twist was, and so that influenced most of his acting. Which is why people keep noticing these little moments in the film that make Snape a more interesting character than he is in the book. Like when Fudge tells him a boy's just been killed, Snape kind of like rushes to check, and seems to relax when he realizes, oh, it was just the yellow one, I almost had a heart attack. The only real hole in the matter that Snape is a spy, and is firmly a spy, is that the story makes it clear multiple times that Dumbledore always had an ironclad reason for trusting Snape, but the viewer is never told what that reason is, and we only find out that reason after an entire book of learning about the fact that Dumbledore is kind of a bad judge of character. I think if anything, Snape serves as the ultimate example as to why you shouldn't wait until the 11th hour to reveal the motivations and explanations of one of your most 
critical characters, you absolute tool. We've had a lot of time to think about it, but when you spend years upon years leaving a character's motivations and their very status as a character up in the air, the audience can tell when they're being jerked around. Indeed, the what if with Snape was compelling to children back when the books first came out, and people keep trying to figure out what it was about Snape that made them invested in the mystery, but none of the others. And the answer is, because it was the first. This kind of mysterious character motivation is fun the first time you do it when you're a child, but I struggle to think of anyone who would find it interesting the 20th time. I got tired of it the second time someone did it in a story, but after Blizzard spent four years jerking audiences around regarding their most popular character, after already having to completely rewrite her to make it work, I just immediately wrote off any writer who pulls that garbage. But where Snape ultimately fails is that the redemption arc is entirely centered around betraying Voldemort and helping in the war, but that isn't the only thing Snape does. The part of Snape that ruins his character in many people's eyes, and justifiably so, because it goes unaddressed, is that he's awful to children. He couldn't have just been a strict, intimidating teacher who gave too much homework and didn't give leniency in regards to rule-breaking. Every school has that one hard-ass teacher that you just hate, even though they're largely just taking a different approach to their job and that annoys you. But instead, Snape is actively cruel. He ignores bullying, even though being a victim of bullying, he should be hypersensitive to it. He mocks students on the things he knows they're insecure about. He threatens to drug Harry on a whim. He physically assaults several students. There are times that he makes the fight against Voldemort harder for everyone because he just can't control himself. Some people say that changing societal values is what changes the perception of Snape, but I don't think so. I understand why knowledge about incel culture makes people think less kindly of Ross Geller, but I think Snape is the result of the audience growing up and being able to put themselves in his shoes and realizing, holy fuck, this guy is actually the worst. You get into appreciation for just how much of a bitch he is half the time. Time. Snape goes out of his way to always assume the worst of Harry at every possible opportunity. He's supposed to be protecting this kid, and at every chance possible, he makes that harder for himself by making Harry despise him. I think the only real thing that is tied to changing social values is that the ubiquity of cell phones has made it more and more clear to people that kids aren't really lying when they say one particular teacher has it out for them. Hell, I had a dozen of those teachers in school. I was a victim of parental abuse whose learned response was petty rebellion against authority. You quickly find out which of your teachers are narcissist when you're like that. And I imagine a lot of people who read these books and were being abused by teachers at that very moment didn't much care for Snape and weren't all that satisfied by his secret motivations being revealed. It feels at times like Rowling, being an early Gen Xer, got these kind of teachers in school but was just conditioned into thinking it was good for her. You know, my father's kind of like this. He went to a school run by the Congregation of Christian Brothers who overwhelmingly bullied students, and he often told me stories about them that were meant to paint them as harsh but fair, but to me it always came off like some religious psychopaths abusing children for fun. And guess what? That's exactly what they were. But for millennials, they tended to not really accept being bullied. They grew up and didn't really have positive feelings about the teachers that bullied them. So a lot of us read about Snape abusing children in ways that probably seem normal to someone born in the 60s, but to us it's unacceptable because it was happening to us at school and we didn't like it. And then we grew up and we still didn't like it. And that's kind of why Snape rots every year, because the public awareness of teacher abuse is more common, because abused millennials grew up and didn't just accept it as normal and started talking about it. And when a 24-year-old talks about being abused by teachers as a child, people listen. When the child talks about being abused, people write it off and ignore it. They don't even bother to check, they just immediately dismiss it as bullshit. I think this is why Rowling is always fighting with people about Snape on Twitter in between obsessing over girls' penis and posting stupid screeds about making sure blood transfusions are pure, which I'm pretty sure was an episode of All in the Family 50 years ago. I, I mean, doctor, you know, a woman's blood going in there, I mean, uh, strange things could happen. I mean, suppose I go bumps. <laughs> then all your shirts wouldn't fit. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, you're being ridiculous. Archie, if the type is compatible, the blood is compatible. Doctor, you don't understand what I'm trying to say. She is... B-L-A-K. <laughs> but her blood is R-E-D-D. -D. She's fundamentally in a deadlock against her own experiences in school and the psychological conditioning to accept it as normal, or at the very least morally gray, and the more modern and correct view of Snape's behavior in that it doesn't really matter if you're anti-Nazi, if you're just a complete fucking cunt everywhere else in your life. This would have been easily handled, but Rowling couldn't think of any other reason for Harry to hate Snape and end up being wrong about him, outside of Snape just being an irrational dickweed for seven years. Snape has a lot of layers to his character, but it's too many layers for a writer as 
blitheringly stupid as Rowling to handle with any grace. As much as I think he largely avoids it, the reason Snape gives off incel vibes is because Rowling is almost incapable of writing romance without incel vibes. She writes Ron the same way most of the time. Hell, in Half-Blood Prince, Harry catches Dean making out with Ginny and wants to curse him out of rage like he's fucking Roy Bryant. His feelings for Ginny are literally described as a monster in his chest. The first inklings of real love for Harry are characterized by predatory violence. This is just all over the books when it comes to romance. Harry and Ron almost never treat the objects of their affections like real people, more like possessions to own, and they become immediately angry when they don't get to. It's very worrying, but I wouldn't hold this as a mark against the characters, because it's largely Rowling's own violent misogyny that characterizes this. The way Rowling writes women is borderline comical at times. Women in Harry Potter are universally defined by motherhood. The women who are on the side of good are defined as being good mothers who care about their children or sacrificing their lives for them, and the evil women are almost entirely characterized as just women who don't have children. Umbridge, Skeeter, Lestrange, they're all evil women who either don't have children or who explicitly hate them. Narcissa Malfoy, who actively defies Voldemort right in front of him, largely does it entirely out of concern for her son. Ginny is supposedly a famous professional Quidditch player later in life, but retires after only three years specifically to start a family and never goes back. I think J.K. Rowling could give Christy Golden a run for her money on how obsessed she is with motherhood. Now, this isn't to say it's bad to write characters who are loving mothers, but these characters' relationship to motherhood is almost never explored. There's a lot of ways to approach and view being a parent, but women in Harry Potter never get to express any feeling on the matter other than loving children or hating children. Furthermore, when the books have to encounter a woman who is decidedly unfriendly, Rowling drops everything to describe just how ugly she is or how mannish she looks. Rowling views women's role in the world as to be pretty and have children. It's right there in how she talks and how she presents her own characters. And that's not surprising because Rowling is a TERF. TERFs don't have a consistent ideology beyond woman bad. They're just women who are anti-feminist and cloak their conservative, misogynistic agenda and progressive like I I'm not gonna play the game and use rad fem as though that's still a word with any coherent application in contemporary politics. Fuck off. But at the end of the day, all they really want is to put women back in the kitchen and gay women back in the closet back in the pantry. Part of the reason they go after trans people first is because trans people fundamentally undermine patriarchal gender essentialism. To a gender essentialist, you're not supposed to escape the fate of being breeding stock by identifying as a man. And if you're assigned male and identify as a woman, you are fundamentally undermining male authority around you. It's the same self-protective violence that sees men brutalized by other men for crying and showing emotions, which, I should point out, conservatives also like to blame on feminists. This was being argued by feminist speakers as early as 50 years ago, and a lot of turf rhetoric lines right up with incel rhetoric, right up to defining womanhood as being able to bear children and referring to women as females like they're fucking Krogan. It's not surprising that Rowling hates women. Her transphobia is little more than another branch of that hatred of women. And the thing about patriarchal politics is that, just like its old friend class, it is fundamentally a servant of white supremacy. Turf definition of womanhood is fundamentally fixated on white, blonde women. They aggressively target black women for not looking feminine enough for their tastes, and their obsession with reproduction and carrying children is an offshoot of that old paranoid great replacement theory. It's also why they want to criminalize abortion. If you don't understand the destruction of Planned Parenthood uh, offices, and you don't understand the wall that we're going to build on the southern border of the United States, you haven't read the book The Birth Dearth by Ben Wattenberg. Ben Wattenberg was a brilliant Jewish man who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute, and he wrote a book, the first paragraph of which says, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He wrote the book in 1987. He says there are, if we don't change this and change it rapidly, white people will lose their numerical majority in this country and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, I'm not misrepresenting, misrepresenting this. I'm telling you exactly, almost exactly what he says. He says there are three things we can do to solve this. Number one, we could pay women to have babies, as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine, unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. He says the second thing we could do is increase the number of legal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then once again, he says, unfortunately, the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. The third thing he says, and white men, women had better pay attention to this, 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Does that sound like racism to you?
And if it doesn't, I want to know why it doesn't. If it doesn't, you don't understand what racism is. And I think it does. When we close Planned Parenthood clinics, because we think they're there only for abortion, we need to take another look. They are used for many, many, many things, and many women need the things that they can get from Planned Parenthood clinics. But we are willing to do away with all that good to avoid allowing white women to have control of their own bodies. Bigotry is intersectional because it's like that by design. Misogyny, classism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, they are all tools of white supremacy. And if you're on board with one of them, you will inevitably be on board with all of them. This is why you cannot have feminism that isn't intersectional. This is why you cannot count someone as a trans ally if they're racist. This is why you should have no patience for anyone who says identity politics is a distraction from class issues. This shit is interconnected. This is why I don't like the perception that what's wrong with Harry Potter is baked into its DNA. That makes it look like an act of God that's pointless to question. Rowling does not just hate trans people. She hates gay people, she hates women, she hates people of color, she hates you specifically watching this right now. It's right there in how she writes, specifically in how she poisons every good idea she's ever had because she can't stop obsessively hating everyone who isn't exactly like her. She poisons her work with near constant distracting screeds about everyone she hates and why they're ugly and why she totally isn't. Pretty much anyone could write this shit better than she could. People have done it. The films junk all that casual cruelty and what bad shit they can't eliminate, they present the honest version of it. You can crawl through AO3 and find rewrites galore all over the place, you know, after you filter out all the usual AO3 garbage. People have actually done it. No doubt Rowling would love for people to think that when her pen touches paper, dangerous liquid ooze comes out, but she's really not that talented. She's a sad old idiot seeking refuge in obnoxious preening self-aggrandizement. I honestly think think it's darkly hilarious that some 17 year old can take her books and spin a better version of them out of whole cloth in less than two years and with a quarter of the word count. That shit is funny. And Rowling is like Elon Musk, she hates being laughed at. She probably likes the idea that she's some kind of dangerous supervillain. This is basic wannabe fascist tyrant stuff. This isn't so much death of the author as it is actively beating the author to death with a piece of bent rebar and dumping the body in the Mississippi River. You know the premise for this video was the bit at the start where I barge in and go, and another thing, but the way this section out and came to a fundamental conclusion about Rowling's misogyny and led into a thesis about the intersectionality of bigotry, I wonder if we can make this a recurring thing. Possibly. Anyway, think about that for a while. Good night.